Can we start from the start? Can we start from your school days? Yes. What was school like? Uh, dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. See, I didn't understand, and I'm talking about when I was five, or the day I went to school, really, I knew there was... Um, I didn't realise there was something wrong, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there was a class full of people, and we we was learning to read and write and spell. And gradually, over a few weeks, I realised there was something not quite right, because other kids could understand what was going on, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, because... The teachers used to write something on the board and I looked at it and and they would be talking about words well and spelling and every time I blinked my eyes the word the letters changed places how did the other kids understand what the word was yeah. when it all changed I didn't realize that they didn't see didn't what see. I saw yeah, yeah. so from probably seven, um, there, were, there was a teacher that would uh, draw a graph on the board and put six words. So there were six boxes, six words. Mm -hmm. Cat, dog, milk, whatever it would be. And then you'd have to go up to the board in turn and point to a word and say what the word was. Right. Well, I knew that um, three across, two down, probably was boy. Right. So that was fine. But the first time that I did it, the kid next to me had, had said the same word. So she said, try again. Well, I couldn't. So I devised this system at six year old, seven year old, I devised this system that three across, two down, was cat. Was it always the same? No, because... I listened. Luckily, I was at the back of the class, yeah. in the middle. So there was a lot of kids before me. Right. And so I had to devise three. There was uh, like one, one across, two down, three down was dog. Mm -hmm. And then there would be another one, cat, and another one, run, for instance. So I'd got three options. Yeah. So I figured that out. So it was like a point to them. And that was it. And that was that was absolutely fine. But of course, classes move on. Books. Words change. Yeah, words change, and books start to to come out. And um, so it was just uh, with getting told off and saying you don't pay attention. You get um, well. In in my case, I got beaten. <laughs> right. So therefore, uh, they teach you truancy yeah, yeah. because you don't want to get beaten so you know on a Wednesday afternoon you're going to have spelling so, so you're ill don't turn up. you don't turn up so if it's like on a, a Wednesday morning and uh, it's reading Tuesday night you set the scene with your mum and dad I don't feel very well and this is not right Neville because he's gone to bed early yeah it's because of fear of the next day. Wow. So the next day, you don't get up and you don't get out of bed. You don't want to. And you say, oh, no, I was... And they go, oh, yeah, he was ill last night. You know, and it was like... Was that every every Wednesday? Then, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, because you... And, and uh, that's what happened. So you had to be very creative. Yeah. Because you didn't want to get beaten. Now, if you... If you lie to your mum and dad, they would beat you as well. Or if you said to your mum and dad, the teacher beat you, well, they'd beat you because the teacher must have had a good reason. Yeah, yeah, And it was like... A real vicious cycle. Yeah, a vicious cycle. And it was dreadful. And then they... And I couldn't explain why I couldn't read. So I said, I can't see the board. Meaning the words keep moving about. Uh, and I thought that was normal. Right. So they moved me to the front of the class. Then they moved me next to the teacher. So then you became the class clown. And then every time you couldn't read, they'd put you in the corner of the classroom. And then people would throw stuff at you. So 
the teacher encouraged the kids because the teacher was horrible to me, so they encouraged the other kids to be horrible. To reflect that behaviour. Yes. So this is, you know, and it's a, a, a downward spiral from, uh, from, from there. And how old, this was like right at the start of school, yes. was it sort of four or five years old? Yeah, I think I went to school about five. And did that continue then until... Uh, until I left school. Until you left school. Until I left school, Ten yeah. or twelve yeah. years later. Yeah, because the first thing I ever read was uh, in uh, about five. The teacher uh, sat at my desk and opened the book, and it was fire, 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 fire. The fire engines raced down the street, and the crowd shouted. Right. So I remembered that. So she said, "Now you read it." And I said, "Fire, fire, fire, fire!" The crowd shouted as the engine raced down the street. And she said, "That's fantastic. That's good. That's brilliant." Turned over the page, said, "Now you read this." So I couldn't. Mm. I hadn't got a clue. I, she hadn't told me what it was. I couldn't remember. Well, I couldn't remember because she didn't, didn't tell me. So then she said, "I'm being awkward." Then you know. Then your class is a little sod. Yeah. And you're disruptive. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, that was my eleven years old. Right? What, what kind of what kind of personality traits do you think that built up in you? Um, it, it, I, I think it built up something where you've Obviously got a bit to of creativity use in terms your, of... You've got to be creative. Yeah. So you've got to be really creative of how do you get out of school. So a thousand different reasons why you're ill why you can't do it you know and um and, and and things like this so the dumb kids uh ended up uh the teachers didn't bother with you so you ended up on the school playing field pulling a cart and throwing stones in every time it rained and the stones come up on the playing field you were the ones that pulled the cart along and picked the stones up and threw them in the cart it's punishment well, that's all you was good for. So there was me, you know, the, uh, we didn't, nobody knew you was dyslexic, mm -hmm. all got ADHD, running about, you know, jumping up and down everywhere and can't control yourself. And it's like, there was me, there was, a, there was the boy with the limp, yeah. there was, there was the unruly one who'd been to Borstal, you know, and, there's, and, and there was the one with the stutter. And there was the big fat kid and the small little run, you know, and it's like all these odd people yeah. that we would pull this car. Do, do you remember anyone else in your school being dyslexic then? Were you, no, you I didn't know. Anyone? Nobody knew what no, dyslexic So no one, had, no one had a similar sort of problem? No, you were thick. Yeah. Yeah, there was people who were thick and unruly, mm -hmm. and I was in that kind You're of in category. The in the bracket, yes. So, um, but it does, uh, it does affect you, because I remember 11 or 12 years old, wanting to end my life because it, it was that bad. Yeah. He was getting bullied from the teachers, bullied from the uh, kids. And, um, and then you couldn't go to your dad and mum because in those days they, they would cane you for not taking notice of what was going on at school. You know, so it was from so all directions and, and you got nowhere to turn. You couldn't tell anybody. Um, so, so therefore you really, really did want to end it. And um, if I'd have known how to have killed myself, I probably would have killed myself. It's that bad. Jesus. And so they, it's not just me. I mean, there must, must be thousands of kids like mm. me. And um, so, but, but there we are. I remember one day, I was uh, about 14, and I've got long hair um, in those days, 1964. And uh, we was having a, we was reading. So each kid would read in turn, and, and, and the better you are, the less you'd do it. And the teacher would say, next, next, next. I didn't even know what page I was on. Let alone, you know, I, I would, let alone what sentence. I hadn't got a clue. So you, could, you at 14, you couldn't really read no. or write then? No, you, could, you couldn't see the words. The words would be dancing around in front of every dancing around the letters would be changing all the time mm -hmm. so you couldn't read it and the boy next to me you know pointed well he pointed to some words that meant nothing to me so I just froze and um, 
the teacher came up to me and grabbed my hair, the back of my hair, and twisted it round and pulled me off my seat and shouted in my ear, read it boy, read it. Well I couldn't, you know, it's impossible. Um, and uh, I started to cry and all the class started to laugh. And by this time there was a big lump protruding out of my head. Yeah. Now this was a boy that could afford his own leather jacket where all the other kids in the in the class had plastic jackets. Mm -hmm. You know, the imitation. But I had my own money. So there I was dressed in a proper leather jacket, a uh, white t-shirt, ice blue jeans, Cuban heel boots. I, you know, it was like I, I was looked the part, yeah. but the brain didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And when we come out of that class to go to another class, there was a load of boys in front of it, it was a boys' school, and it was, uh, and they were saying how thick I was and how dumb I was. And, and I said to them, next year we leave school, you will all get jobs, I will get a secretary. <laughs> I couldn't believe I said, where did it come from? I don't yeah. know where it came from, but that set the scene in my head. Yeah. I cannot do it but I've got to get somebody who can. Yeah. And so that's the kind of stuff that um, teaches you, you know, because if you can't conform, you've got to do something yourself. Yeah. So, so where did you get the leather jacket money from? I always had a job. Oh, right. I, I, I always was uh, um, an errand boy. Always did people's gardens. Yeah. Always collected old bottles. You know, where you got thruppens back. Um, I, so you had a job. You were obviously creating your own job at the time. Then you weren't working for someone else. You were door knocking, yeah. saying, "I'll cut your grass for five." Yeah, or that's it. Clear the snow. Um, yeah. Just do bits and pieces. Collect scrap metal. You know, yeah. take it to the, the scrap metal place. Um, go to the market on a Saturday and buy rabbits and guinea pigs or sell them, you know, and, yeah. and, and do things like that. Did you realise what you were doing at the time? Did you, was, did yeah, you look at your friends and think, why yeah. is no one else doing this? Or Yeah, because they were playing football. Because I couldn't kick a ball, you see. Yeah. If I kicked a ball or threw a, threw a ball, um, it would go somewhere else. Yeah. It would. And it was like, you used to line up. This was the other thing. You'd line up and there'd be two lads who would be the team captains, right? And they would pick the kids and the, and the line would dwindle and dwindle and dwindle and there'd be, there'd be me left. <laughs> you know, and it's like, you didn't pick, they didn't pick me because, uh, as I say, it was, the ball would go the opposite way. Yeah. I'd do an own, own goal or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so not, a big, not a big sportsman then. No, no. So you're obviously honing your craft in terms of learning how to negotiate and learning, you know, to buy at the right price and what stuff would sell. And yes. You were learning how yeah. to be a trader almost then. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So it's from an early age because I couldn't go on a Saturday morning to the playing field and play football mm -hmm. like most people did. So I had to figure out what I was going to do. Well, I always had it. I wanted money. Did okay. anyone around you at that time recognise that you were a little bit different doing that kind of thing? Did anyone say, hold on, Neville's got a leather jacket and everyone else hasn't? How's he got that? Or is that I don't know. I don't know. Was I it something you... your mum and dad recognised or...? No, no. You yeah. obviously didn't really understand the severity of no, the event at the time. Uh, no, I didn't. Not until I was about 40. And then I had a test. And I had a test with my youngest daughter. Yeah. She was going, and, and I kind of plucked up courage to go myself. And they go, well, actually, your IQ, you could have gone to university. I go, well, I couldn't because I couldn't read. No, because if, age 40, there was, there was um, by then, there was helping people in schools. Mm -hmm. They realised what it was. They got it, yeah. Yeah, and they said, oh, you, you, know, you could have gone to university. And I go, well, in that, no, I couldn't because in those days, they didn't. Realised. When did you actually learn to read and write then? Um, gradually. Just gradually. Yeah. I was doing an email last night. Um, it was about 11 o'clock and I was, and Marilyn was going to bed and I said, don't, don't, no, don't go to bed. You need to, to read this because, you know, I, I do, I do ask a lot. And of course there is this, uh, what is it? 
Grammarly, oh, and yeah. Siri, yeah. and that. But they still don't understand. You know, I can write words that even they don't understand. Really? And they say there's no meaning to this word. <laughs> so um, yeah, I ask I ask people how to spell, and I go, oh, hold it, no, three letters at a time, please. Yeah, because I can get three letters at a time. But it is, it's, it's, it gets better as time goes on. Mm -hmm. It does. But I realised that for me to um, achieve my goals and my ambitions and my wants and needs and everything like that, I needed to help people who could help me. And so therefore, I ended up with 120 people around me yeah. who could do everything. Yeah. Everything, anything I wanted and everything I wanted, but I was there also to protect them. Mm -hmm. So it was a two-way street. Even okay. though we, you know, very often they didn't know that I'd be protecting them, and I didn't know, you know, that uh, they probably didn't know I was dyslexic, but most of them did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The core people who was around me all the time, they used to do it for me. They used to finish off my sentences. Um, they, oh, they was really great. They were. Okay, so let's let's go back to the start of this then. So, before Rainbow Warehouse, there was there you was the book. I haven't read the book. No, <laughs> I've just just done a bit of research. So, <laughs> how, how did how did sort of the business start in its in its earlier form? Well, we had. Um, I I met Marilyn when mm. when she was fifteen. I was sixteen. I just turned sixteen, and um, within six weeks we decided that we was going to get married. Uh, have a family and buy a house because we wasn't going to rent. Yeah. So therefore, it was set that these things were going to happen. Where did that notion come from that you didn't want to rent, you wanted to buy? I didn't want to. I wanted, didn't want to give my money away. I wanted to. Um, somebody said to me when I was about uh, ten, I just collected some scrap metal from them and, uh, and and part of it was a bed a metal bed which uh, collapsed and uh, I put this on my cart mm -hmm. and I was going down the road to take it to the scrapyard and this guy come to me said oh, Neville um, what are you doing with that bed and I go well, I'm taking the scrapyard and he said I've just bought a, a house in Skegness which I'm going to rent out he said we you know, we'll, I'll buy it from you. So he said, how much do you want? I said, um, I don't know what, we, what we're giving. He says, 15 shillings. 15 shillings. What, I'd only got about two shillings for it in, Scrap. the, in the scrapyard. Yeah, two, 15 shillings is 75 pence yeah. now. I, I don't know what it would be, you know, probably a tenner or something like that. And he said, what are you going to do with the money? Because it's quite, you know, a 10 year old, quite a yeah. lot of money. I said, I'm, I'm going to buy a house. <laughs> and he says, you'll do well. Uh, that's probably the first person that ever praised me. Yeah. And who was it? Did you know him? Was oh, he was, it was, uh, he was an electrician. He lived down our street. Um, and in actual fact, when I started renovating houses, he uh, rewired lots of houses really? for us, yeah. And his son went into the business, and 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 so yeah. So um, so so I, I knew him. You know, he knew he knew yeah. me. Most of them, or oh, they all knew me round where I lived. You know, all the old people. No, all the character. Well, I, he, 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 this is the lad who would take. Take all the newspapers away, or yeah. you know, <coughs> clear, clear your garden, or clear your garden, or clean your windows, or whatever, it whatever, was. It, whatever it be. Yeah. Okay, so you've met Marilyn. Oh yes, you're yeah. thinking about getting married. Yeah, yeah, and um, and uh, what was the question? I can't. Remember. The question was what What were you doing after you got after you sort of met Marilyn, and you were you were thinking about buying a house rather than renting? Yes, yes. So we we hadn't got any. We wanted to save the money, so. Um, Marilyn was a hairdresser yeah. and she was on about uh, three pounds a week and uh, I was on about ten pounds a week at that time and um, and so 
we lived on her money and saved mine. So we didn't go out. Yeah. Um, so we'd go for walks. That's what we did in the evening, go for walks. And, uh, and, and we had the Freeman's catalogue. Yeah. It was a catalogue that had all the household things. So what we did, we made a list of everything we wanted in the house. And we wasn't going to buy it. We just got the list. And so we went to people and said, uh, like my mum and dad, and said, um, you, you really need a new Hoover. You know, <laughs> because this one's like 20 years old. Why don't you get a new Hoover? Well, and, uh, uh, and we'll have your other one. <laughs> so we collected everything from the house. Yeah. And everybody found out that we was collecting for the house. And they'd go, oh, you can have this and have that. And we didn't need much anyway. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we did. And I made some bedside cabinets in the evening because I went to a, a woodworking um, class mm -hmm. I did. You didn't have to read or write in a woodworking class, you know. So it, th things like that. And then we used to look at houses. And in those days, there was thousands of houses for sale. Which so were, what, we're in the early 70s at this point, are we? No, no, there's no. In 1966, 67, right. 68, we bought our first, in, first house in 1968. Right. We did. And that was a thousand and ninety five pound and we got it for six hundred and fifty pounds. And that's what we that's because what we we'd got. We'd saved up from sixty six to sixty eight, we'd saved up six hundred and fifty pounds we had. And um and I didn't go and offer because I was too scared. And in those days you couldn't buy a house until you was twenty one years old. So therefore, uh, the deeds would have to be in Marilyn's dad's name and my dad's name. Yeah. And what would it be like for two kids, 17, 18 year old, uh, going into a state agent and offering them this amount of money? Yeah. And uh, they'd have just thrown you out. Or I'd have been so embarrassed, I wouldn't have gone in again. So my father-in-law, he didn't care. and. Uh, about going in and offering, so he went in and offered. And um, we, we'd, we'd started offering £400 for a house when we had 400 Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first house we looked at, really, really serious about uh, buying this house, it was up for £600, and we offered 400 And it had air conditioning in it. It meant, when I say air conditioning, it hadn't got a roof on. So, <laughs> so that's the kind of property yeah. we was looking at. So, <laughs> did you have any? Obviously, you're a young man at this point, 17 years old. I think you didn't have any building experience or property maintenance no. experience. You were just trying no. to buy what you could afford. No, we we wanted a brand new, three bedroom detached bungalow, and yeah. it was three thousand pound at the time. And and we went to see the builder, and he put us in touch with somebody who was who did mortgages. And in those days, girls couldn't get mortgages, women couldn't get mortgages. Mm -hmm. It was just the man. And he said, and the first time I'd, I'd heard, ever heard anybody swear who was wearing a suit. And he said, you ain't got no effing chance of getting any money, you haven't. <laughs> so, uh, so we decided that our, um, our dreams of getting a brand new house uh, was just gone. Mm -hmm. So we decided we would not look for anything unless it was the bottom end of the market. Yeah. So if we couldn't get a mortgage, we'd, there was only one other place to go, and that was from the top to the bottom. Yeah. And I do say in my book, you have to go backwards in life to go forwards. And that's just a typical example yeah. of going down to the bottom end and buying something as cheap as possible because that's all you can afford. That's all we can afford, and it was ours. You've got to start somewhere. Yes, that's where we st that's where we started. Okay, so you finally found a house. Yes. To buy. How did the business start then? Oh right. Well, the business didn't start for uh, until 1974. So that was 1968. Uh, so six years yeah. previous, uh, and uh, for six years. I was working for other people and um, job after job after job because when you are dyslexic and people find out you are, that you can't read or write, uh, you run. You run from the job. And in those days it was great because you could leave a job in the morning and get one in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. 
And there was always somebody who knew you who said, I'll give you a job. So I, I remember I left one, um, I got, uh, I left one and seven o'clock that night and knock on the door and um, another person said, I understand that you've left your job. And I said, yes. Uh, his friend was my boss. And they was in a motor club together, and he had obviously rung him and said, "Oh, you know, you know Neville. He's um, Neville he, he, he he's left. Yeah." And so he come and he said, "Would you like to work for me?" And I said, "Yeah." So I started the next morning. Unfortunately, I was useless at the job. I was a grease monkey, mm -hmm. and um, if you if you know what a grease monkey is, is 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 the lowest of the lowest in the yeah. uh, in the in the garage. Well, I had to serve petrol. Well, I couldn't write on. Um, on the till roll, what the person wow. had. And this guy used to come in on a, every week he used to come in and he used to shout and scream at all the lads about writing down whether it was petrol, oil, what it was. He knew it was me, but I lived across the road from him and he didn't want to, I don't know whether he didn't want to upset my dad. He should have <coughs> sacked me. Yeah. He should have sacked me. And anyway, in the end, I said, look, I've got to go because I'm useless at this. And um, how long did you last there? Uh, six weeks. Really? So I it's, went to the Carp Bakery. It's longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he was very good to me. He was very good. He was really good to me. And um, I, I went to, to the Carp Bakery, and he said, and the guy said, "Where have you worked?" And I said, uh, "John Caulfield's Garage." And before that, I worked at Mansus Pig Farm. And the guy said, "Oh, they're in, uh, they're in my motor club." So he rang them. <laughs> asked for a reference. And he asked for a reference. And he says to me, you've got the job. <laughs> so there was obviously something that they thought I was worth mm -hmm. a bet on. Yeah. And uh, I lasted nine months in that job, I did. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. But I learned everything there was, as I thought, to learn in the bakery, baking bread, baking pies, making cakes, in the warehouse all that kind of stuff, because I couldn't stop still. Yeah. I'd got to keep moving. Every every couple of weeks, I've got to move on to the next job and the next job. But I learned such a lot, Yeah. but I didn't realise what I was learning. Did you know at the time you were looking, I presume you were looking at, you know, how businesses is run, no. efficiencies no. and stuff to improve? No. 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 I kept saying to myself, if you pack this job up, you're going to go into the army, because I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. I had this dreadful thing of learning something. I was so enthusiastic. I'd, I'd learn how to bake bread. And then the next thing I would say to the foreman, can I go on to meat pies? Can I, and now I'd learn butchery. And then I'd say, can I go into the warehouse? And I'd learn that. And I kept saying to myself, if you pack this job up, you are definitely going to go into the army. So I packed that job up and uh, I went into Perkins Engines. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was... And I kept saying, if I pack this on, I'm going in the army because I wanted to discipline myself. Yeah. And um, so a bit more focus. Yeah. And and that's but I, I didn't go in the army. Um, I just kept having jobs. Yeah. And then I got sacked at uh, 1973, 74. 74. I got sacked from uh, the Ministry of Defence, and we was living in a caravan at the time because I I bought and sold four houses. And I began to think I was a builder, yeah. but I was rubbish because the last house I got... Sounds like most builders, to be honest. Yeah, the last <laughs> house I got was £7,500, and I didn't realise... Um, I got a mortgage because I'd got a job. I got a mortgage for, I think it was about £4,000. And then I thought I was a builder, so every night and every weekend, I'd... I'd bit, I, I was working on the house, so mm -hmm. first of all I'd rip, I'd rip the windows out, I thought that's jolly good, that's easy, and then I'd rip the walls out, and then I'd rip the plumbing out, and then I'd rip the electrics out, and then I took the chimney stack down, and there's a big hole in the roof, and the recession. You were living in the house at the time? No, I was living in, oh, right. I, we was living in a caravan, because <clears throat> right. the house wasn't fit to live in, not from the start, mm -hmm. and, and um, therefore we lived in the backyard, but I couldn't... I didn't get rid of all the rubbish, it all went in the backyard. So it was just, it was dreadful. It, oh, I brought the row of houses down probably by 50%, yeah. the value of them. 
I didn't realise this. And um, and then I got made redundant. And uh, and the house was worth like two thousand pounds. I bought it for seven and a half. I got four thousand mortgage. And it was and the recession meant the house's price going going down. Well, it must have been worth two two thousand at the most. So that is when um, a three months on the dole, and that's when we decided that I'd got no chance of getting a job. There's millions unemployed. There was a three day week, mm -hmm. uh, so factories could only work three days, and um, and that's when I decided the only way uh, that we would get anywhere was to look after ourselves, because. Um, being on the dole and um, being on benefits, and I can tell you this: there's no benefits to being on the dole. No. And uh, I, I wanted more money. I wanted another two pound a week to survive. And uh, and they suggested having another baby. So that was a turning right. point. Standing there in the dole, being humiliated, and them saying. If you want more money, have another child. And I go, well, I can't afford to feed the one. Because I've got a three-year-old by then. Mm -hmm. Can't afford to feed the one I've got. My mum and, and auntie, my auntie, was giving us food for the baby. So uh, it was like, pity they didn't look at it, me. I was like all of nine stone. Yeah. And was, <laughs> anyway, the, the, that's, that was the turning point of, um, of going going on our own. I didn't realise how much I'd learned in the 17 jobs that I'd had. Yeah. So I'd got no money, I'd got no skills, and what could you do? We went through every single business um, there was, and every day we'd be talking about going into a business. What business? Every day we'd talk ourselves in, then we'd talk ourselves out. And it's fear. And it was, and it was. There was two reasons we talked ourselves out. There was one, no skills to do whatever we decided, and two, no money. And then, for it just clicked. Window cleaning. You don't need any skills really. Yeah. And you don't need any money. So for thirty-seven pence, we bought a piece of scrim. I signed myself off the dole. I thought I was negotiating. I thought I was negotiating another two pound a week because in those days the miners was on strike, the council was on strike, everybody was on strike demanding more money, and I thought I could do the same on the doll. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave. I'll leave if you don't give me any more money. And <laughs> yeah, <there's... laughs> yeah, that's naivety. You know, I signed a bit of paper to sign myself off because I said you can't look after me. The government can't look after me. I'll look after myself. And the guy says, "Are hey, you saying?" You want to sign yourself up? I said, yes, I do. Thinking he's going to give me two pound. He will give me it. I signed it. I, I looked at him, stared at him. And he says, yeah, what well, can I help you? I says, yeah, what do we do now? I said, And he said, do what you want. You don't have to come here anymore. Yeah. Next. And I walked out there thinking, sod them. I look after myself. I got on my bike. It wasn't a motorbike. <laughs> I got on a bike and I rode home and I cried <laughs> on the way home thinking, what have what I done? What am I going to do now? What am I going to do? But halfway home, I'll tell you this, I, I had a paradigm shift really. I'd burnt my bridges and it's time to grow up. Yeah. It was time to look after myself. And so I bought a piece of scrim that afternoon borrowed my father's ladder, knocked on the next door neighbour the next morning and said, I'm, I'm window cleaning, would you? And they go, no, and they slammed the door in my face. I couldn't understand why, but they could see us living in a caravan in this tip, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bringing their house down 50%. Yeah. And uh, so I just knocked on the next one and the next one and the next one. You know, and, uh, it started from there. I realised that window cleaning round was not for me. A window cleaning business was, and it's a difference. Yep. So a window cleaning round, you do 10 houses a day, 50 houses a week, and uh, so you've got to have 100 houses, or 150 if you're doing it every two or three weeks, and that's a ceiling. I didn't want a ceiling. 
I wanted, I wanted a business with no searing for money. And so therefore, I understood in the few days it was a window cleaning business because somebody within the few days said, while you're up there, can you clean the gutters? Now that's not a window cleaning business. That's a property maintenance business. Yep. And the answer, my book's called The Answer is Yes, Now What is a Question? And I would say, yes, I can. Can you mend the fence? Yes, I can. And then people would gradually say, Neville, because I you know, go around these people's houses cleaning windows every fortnight, and, and they'd say, Neville, can you? And I'd say, yes, I can. I'd go, I haven't asked the question yet. I'd go, no, because I'll do anything you want me to do. The answer is yes. Yeah. It's desperation. I wanted to put food on the table. So that's where it come from. And if you don't like a job, which I hated some of the jobs, I just told myself, I loved them. I told myself, this is the best job in the world, and I will do it the best. I love cleaning windows. I love cleaning windows. I bloody hated it. Yeah. I love standing on the ladder in the freezing cold, trembling with cold. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because tomorrow, I won't do it. I'll do, be doing a better job. Yeah. So how quickly did you manage to find, I assume that you found some people to work for you or with yeah. them? And... Marilyn. Right. Yeah, she got a driving license and um, drove, and we got a truck. She drove the truck so she could go to the tip, get the lorry, uh, get the truck emptied and then go to the builder's merchant and she'd get loaded up quicker than any of the blokes would be there standing in line. She'd get the bricks and stuff on. And um, and then I got me, my dad, he um, was just uh, retiring uh, and then Marilyn's dad he worked uh, as a computer operator and and he was on shift work. He came and worked for us. My next door neighbor was a milkman. He got finished at eight o'clock in the morning and he came and worked with us. And that's how we grew the business. I would look, uh, I think they, uh, in those days, it was a pound an hour you could uh, pay. And um, I would look at the job and think how many how how many hours will it take, and then charge giving them an estimate for one pound fifty an hour. Yeah. So therefore, I was making fifty pence for each person. So and I used to micromanage the business, micromanage the job on every site, and um, be working there with them. And then if we could do the job quicker. Then we'd be making two pounds an hour, and and all that money would go into uh, new tools, yeah, and scaffolding and ladders and thing everything you know. So you could do a better, bigger job, bigger job, and uh, it was a learning process every day, every minute of every day. And I talk about have your fifty year goals. Well, I talk about goals. 50-year goal. My 50-year goal was just to be in business. I've been in business now 44 years, I think. Yeah. So be in business for 50 years. So therefore, anybody, because I used to see people packing up, like they'd be in business for six months and they'd pack up because somebody didn't pay them, you know, and things went wrong or whatever, or they couldn't get any work, so they packed up. And so if you've got a goal for 50 years, just to keep in business, you, you can make loads of mistakes or loads of problems can happen, but you get through them because you're in business. Yeah. You, you can't give up and then use that for a crutch for the rest of your life saying, oh, the bank didn't pay me or yeah, whatever yeah. it was. So, so therefore, that was your 50 year goal. Um, your, your, your yearly goal probably was to um, have enough money to pay all the bills. <laughs> and uh, your day to day goals was what is, what's happening today and then you break it down and you do minute to minute goals. Yeah. If you've got four or five people around you, you keep them fed with materials and it's stuff. proper micromanaging. Micromanaging, it? yeah. And then you double the amount of output. Yeah. You do. So And were you at the time obviously you were putting money back into tools and stuff, were you thinking yeah. about buying more properties and investing that money? Yeah, it was a dream. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, we moved. Uh, we was constantly moving uh, houses. Yeah. So as soon as we, as soon as the um, 
price of the properties started to go up and as soon as we had renovated our house that we was living in into it, you would sell it again sell it the day that the paint dried on the last bit of skirting board or whatever it was up for sale yeah and then we didn't mind going backwards so we went from a four bedroom house to a two bedroom house and people go who knew us why have you gone from a lovely area to a house which is tiny and it's got two two bedrooms why have you gone because i couldn't afford to heat the four bedroom house we didn't need a four bedroom house with a big garden we want we wanted the money so and what kind of stress did that put on yours and your wife's relationships i know young you had a young child no. and we were, no, no, like, this is this is a nice house, let's just settle here for a bit. There was no issue because really? Marilyn was desperate for security. And that security didn't belong in that house. Yeah. There was no security in that house, which was too much electric, too much rates. You so know. you both just held that long-term vision in your heads of yeah. paying off a house yeah. or whatever. I won't say house. it didn't upset things because... When she saw her friends having a nice house and a nice life, money for clothes, mm-hmm. money for the it's children, really money for, you know, them. so going out, having holidays. Yeah, um, what happens in, in, in that case from time to time is um, uh, water comes out of your eyes <laughs> and it come out of her eyes a lot. Uh, <coughs> You know, but she understood as well, if we wanted these things in life, then... You have to make short-term sacrifices to get it. You do. And the more we went on, the more we saw people who uh, didn't make those sacrifices coming up against problems. Yeah. But it takes years. And at the end of the day, we used to say, we've survived in a 10-foot caravan, so therefore we can go back to it. Mm -hmm. So we never kept any money for ourselves. It all went in the business because that money didn't belong to us. It belonged belonged to the business as far as we was concerned. So we was living a very frugal life for the first 10 years. Yeah. So it's... um, That's quite a long time as well to live a a life like that, going from a nice house to back to the square one. and But it was also, you looked on a positive side, it, it was, there was a lot of fun. There was a lot of fun in creating, um, being able to do bigger jobs. Now when people was asking, uh, when other people that we knew was going to a customer and saying, I need a deposit and I need paying each week or each month, we could go to a customer and we could say, oh, that job's going to be £3,000. I'm talking about after a couple of years. Mm-hmm. That job will be £3,000. And they go, do you want a deposit? And go, no. Don't need oh, no, I'll have the money when I'm finished. They were with people that we knew. We'd done the window cleaning. Yeah. We'd done the garden. We'd we had done the painting. And then they'd want an extension. Mm-hmm. We knew those people. Those people knew us. And so there was a, a trust. I probably had their keys in my truck yeah. because I ended up, people would say, you're never going to work in my house again because you work here till 12 o'clock at night. You'll never work in my house again. Um, one guy said to me at that, and I was so despondent. I thought, oh, no, I've lost this job. And he goes, well, not while I'm here. I'll give you the keys <laughs> and you'll come when I'm on your day. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how people were. So therefore, if I had the keys for their house and I had their trust, then why should I ask for money if I didn't need it? Yeah. I ask for it when it's finished. The day it's finished, you want pain. I want pain. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So why why didn't you sort of scale that business up and keep that going? What what was the reason you changed course? Um, we we changed we changed course. Before, well. Before we made that decision, um, Marilyn had got quite a few derogatory remarks when we turned up at somebody's house that we'd never done a job before. So we was probably going to do the decorating or mend a roof or whatever. And, and um, 
invariably they'd say, oh, have you brought your wife? Because in those days, you know, 75, 76, 77, people didn't see women on building sites. Yeah. So we used to do subcontracting for other contractors, and that wasn't, didn't seem right. Marilyn would be on the site, there would be six of us going on site. Um, and and, they, and the other guys didn't like it. The women didn't like it when um, Marilyn would go in their house and decorate their house, some of them. So you're only going to have one or two people who's very, you have some derogatory mark, remarks. Um, and, um, and Marilyn said, I don't like this. I, I think now we've grown enough, I'll have an office. So instead of doing the book work at home, I'll, do, I'll, I'll get an office. Mm -hmm. So we, we bought a terrace house to turn it into an office. And then she said, well, it'll only take three or four hours a day to do the book work. What can we do with this? And there were some shops nearby in this terrace of houses. There were some offices and shops. And, and so we said, we'll have a shop. Never had a shop before. What can, what, how can you fill a shop? Well, we've got a 300 pounds saved up. What can you put in the shop that we knew about? And we didn't know anything about shopkeeping, but uh, we thought, well, we bought a second-hand pram for our baby, and we bought a second-hand cot and second-hand high chair. Yeah. So we so knew everything. We knew everything. <laughs> we knew everything there was to yeah. know about um, <coughs> nursery business. Mm -hmm. So we went out at night. Uh, we had a minivan at the time. Went out at night and uh, with a newspaper, people used to advertise the second-hand prams. Yeah. And and bought all these prams, and um, and then started the shop. And then Marilyn didn't have time to do the book work. Now she's got two businesses. Mm -hmm didn't have time to do the book work because it was it was busy in the day so that's where we started and we grew both businesses so i was on the building side yeah. marilyn was on the retail side so we grew those businesses until we got to make a decision where were we going to Fork become the road sort of time. proper builders or was we going to become shopkeepers what was we going to do so we had a re we went to Great Yarmouth uh, to a, a hire a caravan for two days, and we sat there in the freezing cold. And we did nothing but talk about our future, where where which way was we going to go, because the shop wasn't making any money, and the property side um, was it was it was full on, but where was we going to go? And, uh, and we decided that if we went into building roads, which we knew nothing about, you know, if we went into building houses instead of just extensions, there was a lot of risk. And uh, if we went subcontracting, then we might not get paid because there was quite a few subcontractors that didn't get paid. Yeah. And we decided what we would do, our skills were buying and selling and renovating uh, so we could do that for ourselves. We'd already started doing that for ourselves. And I loved the shop. It was clean. Didn't go home, you know, full of brittle dust yeah. and stuff like that. And we wanted to work with each other because we knew two brains were better than one. And you get focused on goals. Two people are worth probably five people being together. So Marilyn didn't want to come back into the building business and we wanted to work together. So I opted for a nice clean job mm -hmm. and, um, and then just do the building work on the sides with subcontractors. Yeah. So that's what we did. And we, we decided that uh, we would focus and concentrate on the shop. And, that, and that's how that decision was made. Okay. 